All right. Hurricane Charlie, as Sandell describes in Justice, wrecks Florida back in 2004, kills a bunch of people, creates you know, tremendous economic damage. Um, and then folks who have the goods and services um, really take advantage of the increase in demand um, to increase their um, profit. So ice is going for 10 bucks a bag, generators, hotel rooms, you know, anything that people now want that somebody else has is going for a, a greater price than when the demand was lower. And Sandell, of course, is wanting us to think, is this just? Um, is, this, is this fair? Now, at the time of this hurricane, it wasn't illegal to do these kinds of things. And really, we, we probably never want to rely on the law anyway to tell us what is ethical. Um, because the law isn't necessarily correlated with morality. We can point to plenty of things that are perfectly legal to do that are deeply immoral um, and probably wouldn't want to make illegal, even though they are deeply immoral. And, you know, certainly you can point to lots of examples, clearly, uncontroversially in, in history, of laws that were themselves highly unethical, right? Think about like segregation and Jim Crow laws. Um, so, so we're not concerned here, and we won't be concerned this semester with legal questions and what's legally permissible. We want to know, you know, did these business owners do something immoral in, in raising these prices? And we might frame the question like this, is it fair, because that's what Sandell's concern is, is it fair for business owners to increase their prices in the face of increased demand? So now this concept of fairness, we'll dive into it in a few weeks in more detail, but what does it mean to say that something's fair? And we'd probably say right off the bat, um, well, fairness doesn't necessarily mean equal. In fact, in some cases, distributing things equally might actually be unfair. So you know, think about the example I sometimes give. You've got two people um, and a limited amount of food, and you've got to distribute, figure out a fair way to distribute it. Well no other information. Maybe you just divvy up the food and give half to one person and half to the other. But, you know, what if one person's starving to death and the other person just finished a meal? Well, then we might say, like, it would actually be unfair to give the same amount of food to both those people in that case. It, what the fair thing to do would be to give perhaps one person all of it, okay? So when we think about fairness and we think about these questions of fairness and was it just, what we're really talking about or what I'm going to ask you to think about um, is this. How, is this is this a justifiable distribution of risk, of reward, of suffering? Can I can I justify this? And of course, how I justify it is going to depend on my value. So we're still in search for those. Like, what are those things that really matter to me? So when I ask you, is it fair for these business owners to increase their prices? Resist the urge to to you know just right out of the gate judge them harshly until you've thought about kind of all that's at stake here. So, so think about it this way, just to complicate things. So on the surface, you have this, um, you have these business owners who appear to be taking advantage of people who are vulnerable, which is kind of an icky thing to do, perhaps. Um, but on the other hand, balance that out this way. Isn't that what business is? In other words, if you have an unmet desire isn't, doesn't business exist as a way of capitalizing on your desire or your, your, your want to fulfill that desire? Now, I recognize here, you know, you're thinking to yourself like, well, gosh, there's some basic necessities here. Um, we're talking about food, water, shelter. Okay. So now let's look at another piece, right? So fairness is the justifiable distribution of risk, reward, suffering. What does it mean to be deserving of something? And again, we'll dig into this here in a couple of weeks. What does it mean to be deserving of something? So there's certain things you have a right to even though you might not be deserving of it. Um, and then there's certain things that you may not have a right to, but you're actually really deserving. So maybe you say to yourself, well, every Floridian I know has a right to not be punched in the face, even though they may deserve to be punched in the face, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or maybe they don't deserve to, to be pun punched in the face. Um, so when you when we talk about somebody deserving something, ordinarily what we we're talking about is not necessarily a legal right. We're talking about some sort of a moral claim. Um, I deserve the grades I get in my classes because I work really hard. Um, 
so-and-so didn't deserve the grade uh, he or she got in the class because it was a really good grade, but they didn't work hard. So is each Florida equally deserving of food and water and shelter? And what's relevant to me in that case is this, is that you have some people who make sacrifices in the short term in order to be prepared for these events in the long term. So let's say you live in Florida. If you live in Florida, if you've chosen to live there, you've chosen to live in a place that gets hurricanes. Um, if you choose to live in California, you've chosen to live in a place that has earthquakes. Now, there are going to be some people who prepare for those things and they say, like, all right, well, I'm going to have um, I'm going to have a, 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 an emergency box in my car um, that has my medication, some water and some food in case there is a wildfire or there is an earthquake or there is a hurricane. I want to make sure that I have what I need to take care of myself were that to happen. And then there's going to be other folks that say like, ah, peace out, man. I just go with the flow. I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to, what's it called? Future trip. I'm not going to future trip. I'm not going to catastrophize. Whatever happens, happens. Okay. So now I've just kind of really grossly designated two groups of people. And I recognize there's more groups than just the two I've designated. There are those that don't have this choice available to them, but all things being equal, um, I'm going to guess that if you've got 2000 bucks for a generator when power isn't actually an essential uh, to, to life, if you've got 2000 bucks to throw down on a, ge a, a generator, you probably had the ability to prepare for this uh, eventuality living in Florida of a hurricane, and you could have gotten one when they were 250 bucks, but you didn't. But somebody else said, you know what, I'm going to risk my finances by opening up a business that sells generators, I'm going to invest in a whole bunch of generators risking that they may never actually get purchased and hoping that at some point people really want what I planned for and got. Okay. And so you think about these two questions here kind of companioned up with one another. When I ask you, is it fair for business owners to increase the prices? Think about first the generators. I mean, that's a t almost a tenfold increase in or you know, sevenfold increase in the price of generators. But those people that bought the generators to sell before the hurricane planned ahead, took a risk and made a sacrifice in the short term. They spent that money on a whole bunch of generators when they could have spent that money on something else that brought a much more short term benefit. And then there's all these people that now have the cash to throw down the 2000 bucks who didn't plan ahead and used that money for something else at the time. So is the business owner morally obligated to forfeit their profits for the benefit of others? So think about these three questions all in alignment with one or not all in alignment, but think about them all at the same time and see if you can't flesh out for yourself what kind of matters here. Cause I think you're going to come down to a conflict between consequences versus uh, motivation or or some sort of principle okay so if if you're really upset at those business owners and you want to kind of punish them for this what you're perceiving as a yucky quality of greed then that means something and so th th and that's important to know on the other hand if you say like even though i don't like the way this looks i recognize that in the long run we're much better off if we incentivize entrepreneurship by creating the possibility that people can, if they take the gamble, people can kind of win the lottery and have, a, for whatever reason, a sudden increase in demand for what it is that they have, right? Because if you're a business owner and you take this risk and you make this investment and then somebody else comes in and says, oh, because we have an emergency, we now want what you have to give to these other people. Some people are going to look at that and say, like, well, why would I open up a business? Right? You kind of see this happening right now in this argument about, you know, let's pay for stuff by taking it from Amazon. Um, we're just going to take Jeff, what Jeff Bezos owns. We're either going to take his money through some sort of a wealth tax or we're going to take his products. And we're going to say, well, because you have it and I don't and you're super wealthy and you're not going to fill this, I'm just going to take this. All right. I get the argument, the kind of Robin Hood type argument. But is that going to disincentivize people from building big companies that provide people with services that they like? And if there's fewer people willing to take that risk, does that allow for the kind of competition that ordinarily allows prices to be driven lower? Because somebody could come into Florida 
and say, oh, wow, man, I can take my janitors, janitors, my generators that I have in my store over here in Georgia, and I'm going to go over to Florida, and I'm going to sell them to these victims of this hurricane for, for $1,500, less, $500 less than these guys. Well, then the other guy that sold them for, the other person that sold them for $2,000 said, like, oh, my gosh, this guy is going to ruin my business because everybody's now going to buy generators from um, the guy that sold them for $1,500. So I'm going to now sell mine for 1000 And so you have this concept where because entrepreneurship is being incentivized at least theoretically the prices drop over time because people are in in competition with one another for customers but in order to reap that benefit that consequence you're going to have to allow even if you don't have to praise it you're going to have to allow greed to exist right because you're you're going to have to allow people to want to take that gamble of getting more for themselves and by leaving that possibility open for them to express their greed, you're going to get more people who are willing to do it. And theoretically, the more people you have that are willing to take these risks and run these businesses, the, the lower the price of things, the higher the availability of things, and in theory, the benefit to the greatest number. Now, you also probably want to think about this. What matters to you more that people have the freedom to take those risks and be able to succeed or fail at something or that there be sort of equality of outcome okay so we used to have this thing in the california community college system um, where we talked about or the state did that students have a right to fail they have a right to attempt whatever courses they want um, and be successful or not in those and then that got switched around to like well no you don't want to have an equal right to fail, you want to have an equal right to success. And what that's meant is, okay, so now we've got to make sure that everybody is equally successful, regardless of kind of where they began. Well, there's costs and benefits to that. If you, if you want a particular consequence where you create equality on the output as a, as a consequence of your policies or your actions, then you're probably going to have to make some sacrifices of the freedom of the individual people who are getting sort of put through the system and sort of the same thing in Florida. If you want to have it so that everybody has equal access to generators and bags of ice and food and shelter and so on and so forth, you're going to have to take away something from everyone in order to distribute it equally. Okay. So there's actually really deep, complicated um, principles at play here. And, and I want you to think about like, well, how do I, kind of land here? Do I stand more on these principles or do I stand more for these consequences? Um, and again, this is going to help you make that distinction um, between consequentialism and, and non-consequentialism. And your goal, of course, is to be consistent. So if you think, so for example, if you say, oh my God, these business owners have these generators, they have these bags of ice, they're taking advantage of people. I think we're morally justified in going and taking their things away from them, taking that profit away from them by putting a, a price gouging cap on them. All right. Well, to be consistent, then we would have to be able to do the same thing to you if we thought you had something that we all needed that you didn't need as much as you think you did. OK, so, for example, we might say something like, I know you think uh, you have a greater claim to your house and your home because you pay the rent on it that you earn from working your job. But this person over here wasn't fortunate enough to have that job or that bed. And we think we're justified in taking some of that space in your home and giving it to this person. Right. And so to be consistent, you'd have to at least leave yourself open to the possibility that if we if we make this judgment that we can stand on principle, either equality of outcome or, or punishing greed or something along those things, we're going to have to open ourselves up to the possibility that, well, we're playing in this game too. Remember impartiality. So we're looking to be consistent here. What do we really want to live with? And I'm giving you this example because there's really no good outcome here. Um, I shouldn't say it that way. There's no clear position. You're going to give something up. If you choose to punish greed, you're going to get a, a, a reduction of competition. 
On the other hand, if you choose to incentivize entrepreneurship, you're going to have greedy people operating in the world. If you choose to allow people to be free, they're going to fail. On the other hand, not all the time, of course. On the other hand, if you want to distribute everything equally to everyone, you're going to have to take from someone. And that's going to, so you just, and, and that's someone maybe you. So you're just looking to be consistent. And as you do this, and I'm going to remind you of this, really resist the urge to assign bad motives to those who disagree with you. So, so just because somebody doesn't want the same outcome as you doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person, right? So this guy, Thomas Sowell, I think he's an economist, conservative guy. He had this great quote. He says, it's amazing how many people think that they can answer an argument by attributing bad motives to those who disagree with them. Using this kind of reasoning, you can believe or not believe anything about anything without having to bother to deal with facts or logic. The, the truth is you'll probably never know someone's motive, okay? So it's, it's probably not something worth seeking out. Instead, think about the weight of the arguments that they have in their favor. So a good example of this is, is this. I, I think without exception, I, I, I mean, I, I got to believe this is the case. Everybody who's reasonable, rational, and ethical wants everyone else to have access to good medical care. I mean, who the hell disagrees with that proposition? But there might be disagreements about how actually, how actually to provide that. So you might have something that says, well, I think that, you know, like a Medicare for all, some sort of a, you know, a system, government system, I think that's the best way to deliver it. And then somebody else says, well, no, actually, I think that um, the best way is through competition in an open market. Okay, so now you have polar opposite approaches here. And immediately it becomes... Oh, so you're the commie who wants to take away all my freedom because you hate the individuals and you want us to all turn into, um, you know, Maoist, Stalinist, uh, uh, communists. And then the other person says, oh, and you're the heartless, you know, greedy one who wants the free market to make people die. And it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's like, well, we're not getting anywhere on this one. So as you're thinking about these things, really resist the urge of demonizing those who draw a different conclusion than you do and think instead about digging in and finding what those principles are. All right. So in Sandel, he talks a lot about the Purple Heart recipients and the bankers. And I promise you we'll get to those things uh, in a discussion shortly. We just won't cover it here.